Hi, my name is Judy Fan, and I'm an assistant professor of psychology at UC San Diego. I'm really excited to be participating in this workshop and want to thank the organizers for making this virtual version of it possible. Full disclosure, I'm not a roboticist. I'm a cognitive scientist. And I'm interested in how people develop communication protocols to convey information and knowledge that they think is important using whatever information modalities they have at their disposal. And in my talk today, I'm going to focus on graphical communication and how people learn to produce and interpret graphical messages that are pitched at the right level of abstraction. So what do I mean by that? Here's an example. When you look at this scene, what do you see? I see about a dozen people, a mix of ages, facial expressions, postures, arranged in a particular way, each holding on to two others. Another way of answering that question is to make a picture like this, which abstracts away most of the information in the scene, such as the identities of the people, but preserves information about who is holding on to whom. Or even more extreme, a drawing like this, which abstracts away the people altogether, but preserves the topology of the knot they've made. Both the first drawing and this one could be derived from the same scene, but look quite different and be useful for different purposes. And to see the correspondence between this picture and the original scene might even require some practice. So a primary goal of my lab's research is to understand how the human mind is flexible enough to pull off these feats of visual abstraction. That is to communicate what we see and know in a format that other people can understand. Communicating using these abstractions has played a major role throughout the history of science, with drawings, diagrams, and other visualizations having been powerful tools to both make and share discoveries. While some of these images may look like, to very degrees, physical things in the world, birds, moons, neurons, particles, they're all abstract representations that actually leave out many details. And in the case of Feynman diagrams, depict events that are not directly observable that you actually need special training to interpret. So this is the fundamental problem facing a theory of pictorial meaning. How is it that so many different kinds of pictures, some which look realistic and others which really don't, can still look meaningful to us? So let's start with the most basic scenario where we have something in the world, say this bird on the left and a drawing on the right, which we perceive to represent, even resemble the bird on the left. What mechanisms allow us to see this correspondence? So on the one hand, perhaps you have the intuition that this shouldn't be so hard since line drawings are made of edges and edges, as it turns out, can be pretty easily extracted from images. At the far other end, the philosopher Nelson Goodman famously argued in his book, Languages of Art, that the ability to perceive drawings as representing objects can't depend on resemblance because there aren't features that they both share. Instead, pictures denote objects through arbitrary but conventionalized habits of seeing, much the same way that words denote objects. For instance, how this text refers to the man in the photo. And according to this view, the way a drawing corresponds to a photo can't depend on the content of these images alone. So coming to this debate 50 years later, from the perspective of computational neuroscience, in prior work, we reframed the question of how representations of sketches and natural images of objects converge as being basically the problem solved by the ventral visual stream, which is a set of regions in the brain along which simple visual features encoded in the early, earliest areas of visual cortex are transformed successively to support object identification in high-level visual cortex. And we built on abundant and converging evidence from the past six years that deep convolutional neural networks, or CNNs, optimized on challenging visual tasks can learn general purpose feature representations that not only predict neural responses along the ventral stream, but also support a wide variety of visual tasks beyond recognition. And we discovered that such networks provided a strong basis for a visual encoding model that could capture the perceptual correspondence between sketches and natural images of objects, suggesting that these commonalities can be computed on the basis of the visual properties of these images alone, providing 
novel evidence for an updated resemblance account of how pictures derive meaning. But obviously, that's not the whole story. A pure resemblance account, however sophisticated, runs into difficulties explaining how drawings like these are meaningful, which we make all the time when talking to each other, um, and yet look nothing like anything in the world. So how do we get away with this? So our basic idea is that social context matters. Even a few squiggles can make sense if you know that your uh, colleague knows what you're talking about. How do we manage to communicate using such a diversity of graphical styles? We propose that pulling this off requires combining both perceptual information, the semantically meaningful content that our visual system is able to extract from raw sensory inputs, and social context, our ability to tailor how we produce and interpret images according to whom we're interacting with and what goals and knowledge we share. And the idea is that while both of these sources of information matter, their contributions vary across contexts. And close to each endpoint of this axis, either perceptual information or social context dominates. So for example, on the left, these drawings correspond to the bird primarily in virtue of visual properties they share with the bird image. On the right, however, exemplified by these Chinese characters, are symbols that correspond to the bird in virtue of an abstract symbolic relationship that only literate members of the Chinese language community will understand. And in a recent study, my collaborators and I explored this basic idea that these two sources of information trade off against one another. And we did this by varying how much shared knowledge two human participants shared, which they accumulated over the course of an extended communicative interaction with one another. Specifically, we set up an online environment, which we then furnished with realistic renderings of the most exciting objects we could think of and then invited two people at a time to play a drawing-based reference game in which they repeatedly communicated about them. On each trial, one of these objects was privately queued for the sketcher, who then had to make a drawing of that target object so that their partner, the viewer, could figure out which of the four objects they'd meant to refer to. So one sketcher drew this. And then once the viewer made their choice, both received feedback, so the sketcher found out which the viewer had picked, the viewer learned which one was actually the target object, and then they moved on to the next trial. And they drew this object not just once, but eight times over the course of their interaction, interleaved among the other three objects in each of eight repetition blocks in which each object appeared as the target one time. And we'll refer to these objects as belonging to the repeated condition. Now, in order to disentangle the effect of repeated reference, per se, from general task practice effects, we also included a second set of control objects, which were drawn only once at the beginning and end of their interaction. You might have noticed that each set of objects consisted of highly similar exemplars. We deliberately sampled these sets of objects in such a way that it would be initially challenging for participants to produce an informative sketch that contrasted the target from the distractors. We targeted one of the most densely populated object classes within the ShapeNet 3D object database, and then applied clustering over their visual features to derive two sets containing eight objects each, which we then randomly assigned to condition and pair. So let me show you some of our raw data. On the left is uh, a target object, and on the right is the drawing made on uh, the first repetition by one of our participants. As they kept having to draw that object, here is the trajectory of how what they drew changed over time. Now, here's that same object, but now a sequence of drawings produced by a different sketcher from another interaction. As you can see, in this interaction, they focus on the top rim of the backrest instead of the seat. And these are some more examples of different trajectories. What popped out to us as we scanned from left to right is how the later drawings appeared to get sparser. And this was borne out quantitatively. The number of strokes used decreased reliably across repetitions. 
which naturally made us wonder what impact this was having on their ability to communicate. Were participants just getting tired, losing steam? So here I'm going to show you a plot of how well participants were performing the core communication task over time across repetitions of each object. We primarily measure task performance in terms of efficiency, which we preferred because it balances gains in accuracy against changes in response time. Though we basically see the same trend when we measure accuracy and RT alone. What we found were highly consistent gains in efficiency for the repeated objects. This slope was highly positive, meaning later trials were substantially faster and more accurate. But we wondered whether this might just be a practice effect, whether these gains meant that participants were mostly just getting used to the interface. So we also examined the change in efficiency for the control objects and found that, yes, while participants did generally get better at the task, the improvement is consistently greater for the repeated objects, suggesting the benefits of repeated communication was partly specific to those objects they drew a lot. So then we thought, perhaps these gains still just reflect the effect of practice for those objects and these later sparser drawings are identifiable because they still strongly resemble a target rather than being effective due to shared interaction history. So to measure the contribution of these drawings inherent visual properties, we took advantage of the fact that we had multiple sketchers draw each object repeatedly. And insofar as these visual properties were driving communication task performance and not the accumulation of shared knowledge between the two participants in a particular interaction, we figured that if we scrambled these drawings across interactions and then showed them to naive observers, they should be able to match each drawing to its corresponding object just as well as the original viewers had. So we recruited 245 new shuffled participants to do just that. They completed exactly as many trials as the viewers in the original communication experiment with exactly the same repetitions of each target object, with the only difference being the sequence of drawings they tried to identify all came from different interactions. However, there were other differences between what the shuffled group experience compared to the original reference game viewers. For instance, the original viewers were able to see each drawing being produced stroke by stroke, in real time and interrupt as soon as they knew their decision, whereas the control group viewers only saw the final drawing and didn't have the ability to give the sketcher feedback in the form of interruptions or by waiting longer. So to control for these differences and to give us an estimate of the contribution of this viewer feedback, we included a second yoked control group that saw exactly the same sequence of drawings from a single dyadic interaction. So their experience was quite close to that of the original reference game viewers. So here I'll be showing you again communicative efficiency over time for these three groups, the original communication group, as well as the yoked and shuffled control groups. This communication group curve is the same one we saw before. And overall, we found really strong gains in efficiency for the yoked group, which we expected given that their experience was so close to that of the original viewers, although not quite as good, suggesting that viewer feedback also contributed a bit to gains in performance. But by far the most salient finding from this experiment was that this gap between the yoked and shuffled groups who performed exactly the same task of identifying a sequence of sketches of the same targets the same number of times, the only difference for the shuffled group being that the sketches had come from different interactions, suggesting that continuity in interaction history does play a role in explaining how people were able to succeed with ever sparser drawings. Raising the question, if there are interaction specific dynamics at play, what are they? So it looked to us from afar that what they might be doing is one, discovering a way of drawing this chair and then settling on it. And two, that different people were discovering different ways to do that. So to test these two ideas, we analyzed how these drawings changed over time. And building on our prior work, we extracted high level feature vectors for each drawing using a CNN and analyze the similarity between these feature vectors across interactions and over time. In order to determine the extent to which people were discovering a way of drawing this chair and then settling on it, we computed the similarity between successive drawings, here schematically illustrated by the angle between their feature vectors. So first and second, second and third, third and fourth, etc. And if they're indeed converging on a way of drawing each object, then we should see their correlation increase across repetition pairs which is indeed what we find. 
Next, to evaluate to what degree participants from different interactions drew even the same object in different ways, we analyzed the similarity between drawings made by different participants on each repetition block, here schematized by the angle between these two vectors. And we indeed found that the similarity between drawings produced in different interactions decreased across repetitions. In other words, the drawings different people were making the same object were diverging over time. So to summarize, we found in this study that repeatedly depicting an object supports efficient visual communication. And that such efficiency was supported by both the visual properties of the drawings, but increasingly by continuity in interaction history. And that these communicative drawings tended to become more consistent within an interaction, but increasingly different between interactions, suggesting that multiple solutions may exist in the space of graphical conventions that can be used to solve this coordination problem. And I think the upshot for robotics and HRI researchers is that humans can rapidly develop sophisticated communication protocols using a variety of different information modalities, including action, graphics, and language. And I hope that a deeper understanding of what properties human communication protocols share across these different modalities will help inspire strategies for developing more robust human-robot communication. This work was done in close collaboration with Robert Hawkins, Meg Sano, and Noah Goodman. Our code and data are publicly available in our GitHub repo, and you can find the paper on my lab's website. So thanks for listening, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion.